we're back for week two of Philippians. It is good to be with you in your group or with you online. Honored to have Pastor Chris this week, and we're going to get into some good stuff uh, this week. This week, and one of the things I was trying to do is I wanted to match the icebreaker with with each guest we have each week. And so, um, as I was thinking through Philippians and Pastor Chris, and what's what's unique about you is Pastor Chris. I think you're just one of the most positive people I've met, and uh, genuinely, you really are. And so, I thought this week. Let's let's start by asking what was the best thing that happened to you last week or in this last mm-hmm. week, and um, you know I'll, I'll start to stall and give you guys some time to think. Uh, for for me, it's it sounds weird and it might even sound a little uh, cliche, but uh, actually my family got sick last week, and you know not being sick is not fun, but I just love that time at home. I love the time with the family. I love the time of just throwing on a video. And, and sitting on the couch together. So I've just really cherished uh, some good memories um, and time at home uh, with, with our kids and, and with Stephanie, and I just really valued that. So how about for you, Chris? I think it, uh, two things, Matt. Uh, one Friday, I got to reconnect with a friend that uh, has been a friend through various seasons of my life. and uh, Those are exceptionally rich. Uh, sometimes you have friends for seasons, and your work takes you to a new place, you have to say goodbye to some, learn some others. But this one's been around uh, through the last several, anyway. And then uh, I had a really great week with my spouse. We uh, were living in the new seasons with each other and learning uh, old dogs need to learn new tricks. And I'm the old dog here in this equation. And uh, we had a great week of some deep conversation, giving thanks uh, to God for that. Awesome. So uh, go ahead and go around your group and just share you know, what was the highlight of, of your week. And then from there, go ahead and read Philippians 1, uh, verses 1 through 26 as a group. And just once you're done reading that, uh, then you can go ahead and, and resume the video. So go ahead and press pause, uh, do the icebreaker, read the uh, scripture, and then we'll be back. Well, all right, this week uh, we get into the actual meat of, of the book of Philippians, and I was digging into uh, the letter a little bit, and so this is actually a letter by Paul. He's, he's in prison, and he's writing to the church at Philippi, which, which he helped to found and to start, and the main point of the letter is to thank them for a, a gift they have sent him while he's in prison, and, and the why to that, we'll get with Pastor Chris in just a little bit, on that, but I, I wanted to pull out a few things from Philippi that the the city that this church is in that I think are really relevant to our context here in the United States as well. And so one of the first things is that Philippi was an outpost for the Roman world, and both Mark Antony and Augustus had um, left had settled veteran soldiers there after their their time in the military. So this was a very patriotic, very nationalistic. Society, and so we we definitely in the U.S. can relate um, to to their their deep roots in nationalism, and we'll see some of this a little later when Paul says, uh, "But hey, your citizenship's in heaven." And so there's there's going to be some contrast there that we can probably relate with. Um, another thing is that it was governed by Italian law, which was the highest level level of law in the Roman Empire, and so this was an honor that they they had, and and we also are a society that that. Um, holds to very sound um, law principles, and, and that's a, something we very, really value as as a society. And then, and then last, which I'd already mentioned, just that you know Paul's writing a, a simple letter of thanks to a church he loves. Um, this is some of the most intimate writings of of from Paul. He's not he's not like mad at this church. He mm-hmm. he's really thankful for him. Whereas you know, there's other times he's got he's got a problem to address, but he's really thankful for this. For this city, and so you know, in the opening verses, just to give you one little word to look at, in, in verse two, it says, "Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ." Well, the word "Lord" there was a political term, and it, it was designated for Caesar. And so you think about this: he's writing. Um, we know here in, from the second to last verse that he's writing in Caesar's house, which is you know one of a, a Roman prison. And he's using this word, and, and it's very probably combative if someone in Philippi, with all these warrior veterans, <laughs> uh, to hear this, this term of Jesus is Lord, 
go, no, no, no. In that society, it was Caesar was Lord. So he, he opens right out the gate by saying, no, uh, we, we're a different set of people and that, that Jesus is Lord. And then, and then he goes into, um, starts into the letter. And, but before we do that, another just really central part that as we were preparing, Chris, you shared with me some stuff on, on what it meant to be in prison mm -hmm. in the Roman world. And so can you elaborate on, on what that meant and give us some context to the situation? Sure. Thanks, Matt. Uh, basically, Paul, if you study his missionary journeys, he was either in prison, getting out of prison, <laughs> or getting ready to go into prison. <laughs> uh, at least three different locations. He was in prison for a multitude of years, actually, and from uh, Caesarea to Rome. It was uh, a multi-year handoff. You can uh, look up that sometime for your own history and context, if you like. But at that day and age, there there wasn't the support that even in our uh, limited and imperfect incarceration um, method or systems that we have today, uh, you still get three meals a day, you still get clothing, you get an allowance, uh, you can earn good points, good behavior, you get to uh, exercise in a yard. In biblical times, you'd have been lucky to survive. Uh, your food wasn't dependent upon the system of taxes that support the incarceration. Uh, your food was dependent upon who visited you and, and uh, maintaining those relationships with key. Uh, your clothing, uh, he, he makes an appeal for a cloak. Come before winter uh, in uh, 2 Timothy, I believe, where uh, his, his basic sustenance, it's like prison in a third world country, uh, if you get imprisoned in Haiti, it's the same modus of operandi, and uh, you really take your uh, fate in your own hands. It's it's uh, much more much more fleeting uh, an experience and tenuous uh, a destiny. Yeah, yeah. So that I think that really sets the stage. Like thinking third world grungy prison mm -hmm. um, where Ch chained to guards. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't go where uh, you weren't allowed your uh, chain to guards or a pole. Uh, he uh, would develop good relationships, though, with uh, the uh, soldiers who were in charge of him and started <laughs> the first Christian prison ministry, basically. But uh, this uh, in prison motif is, is heavy throughout all of his writings and makes the personal uh, remarks uh, ever so more touching in his love for the church and the people he he uh, depended upon them and uh, I don't know you get you get a little sappy at least I do when I think about um, you get poor medical news and you're not sure if you're going to survive he was in that mindset for months and in fact years not knowing what his ultimate fate would be and you just cut to the chase more and speak straight to the heart and we'll see some of those places here in a moment and so we, we take that in setting and yet, all throughout this letter, he talks about thankfulness, rejoicing. He says, rejoice in the Lord seven times, which uh, that word rejoice is really like a public celebration uh, of, of Jesus and what he had done for them. And so, um, we, you know, we, we left it in verse two. And then in verse three, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. And just all throughout this, there's, there's this setting of thankfulness. And so, um, could you... You know, one, one of the quotes I ever found here is that school, scholars really say that I thank you sets the tone for the entire book of Philippians. And so can you talk about our ability to choose to be thankful and rejoice in any and all situations? Yeah, um, until a couple of weeks ago, I could understand that intellectually and knew the principles. And yes, this is a strategy for our, our own spiritual health and well-being. But uh, in the last couple of days, uh, intera interacting with that friend of mine, he was in the middle of the Fort Lauderdale airport shooting, right mm -hmm. in the middle of it, in mm -hmm. the one baggage claim area, and uh, two people to his right were shot point blank, were killed, one person to his left, wow. I think if I remember correctly, and he came face to face with the terrorist, and as he ducked, the bullet grazed his scalp and uh, likely got the person behind him. World's one of the world's worst tragedies. Yet even in the midst of that, uh, 
as he's uh, sharing the absolute heartache, the horror, uh, there were blessings that he attributes to God that would come through and would just, and in the midst of the agony of the tragedy, he'd start weeping for joy. Mm. Uh, the FBI agents that were assigned to him to take his testimony, to uh, make sure he didn't leave, to accompany him, one on either side. Like, uh, like Paul's guards, man means it for evil, God means it for good. Uh, assigned out of the tragedy, but they became some of his best friends and his protection that day. And He couldn't eat because they were all attending to the scene, but the uh, FBI agents would give him their power bars just to get him through Mm. Uh, eight to ten hours uh, as this whole horrific uh, story unfolded. And, and then moments of grace throughout the day were from others, and then uh, the week that followed, uh, even in the midst of the worst, God's uh, grace extends unto us and meets us at our point of need, uh, deep, more deeply at our point of need than what we ever realize. And, uh, I saw tears of joy. So instead mm. of just intellectually knowing it, I saw it experientially in action, and it was transforming. Wow. So uh, no matter how bad life may get, I don't think anyone could have a more uh, of a worse week than my friend a couple of weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale. God's goodness still shines through, and I think that's how Paul learned to live, as he was either in prison. <laughs> Uh, getting out of prison or getting ready to go into prison, in and through that all, in and through that all, God tuned his heart and his soul to be grateful mm. uh, because God's goodness so outweighs the sufferings of this present time. Uh, reference to Romans eight. Wow, yeah, that's so good, so good. And we're that's just woven all throughout this book. And so uh, next week in chapter two, we're going to hit that a little bit in the mind of Christ, and then mm -hmm. and then in, in week four, we're going to hit it. Or, or week six in Philippians four, we're going to hit where when he says, uh, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And he goes on to say, do not be anxious about anything, mm -hmm. but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. you, you see that disclaimer in there with thanksgiving all throughout his writings. So we're going to, we're going to continue to develop that, that thought as we go. Yeah, this is, Paul's not writing these words because he thinks, oh, this is a good thing to say and a, a teaching my church is going to need. Uh, yes, but it's more than that. He's writing these things because he's living these things. Mm -hmm. And he wants uh, his people to live these things and not just intellectually know them, like, oh, I need to be a more thankful person, but the dynamic, uh, the life-giving force that's released that we enjoy, mm -hmm. that we can share in the midst of all of it. Uh, that's what's most uh, exciting when you read it with the lens of him being in prison, not knowing uh, his ultimate fate, and yet uh, what unites him, what drives his heart, is this gospel message that still delivers. Mm. So, so from that, while he's still in the opening, in verses 9 through 11, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless, for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so that, that, praise, that prayer really sets the, the tone and, and the rest of the book up. Um, can, you, can you talk a little more about this prayer, about um, this, this prayer? And, and another way is, you know, how can, we, how can we integrate this prayer into our prayers for you know, our friends, our spouse, our kids? Yeah. Love it that you highlighted this, uh, Matt, because here, like what he shared uh, already, this isn't a rote observance for him. He's not putting in a prayer because, oh, uh, the letter needs a prayer at this moment. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was an expression of his heart that he lived. Uh, when we pray, there's times when we'll pray at dinner time or for th a Thanksgiving meal, and we'll put some extra special attention into it. You know, it's a more public setting, a more public forum. You want to sound good for your friends or in life group and when you open up. Um, I think this was more a prayer of his open heart uh, for a people that he really loved. And uh, it's interesting to me, he's like acknowledging in verse 9, uh, one of the 
leadership principles that I've grown up with, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Hmm. And sometimes I think we get caught in our Christian life and experience where uh, we get saved, we come to Christ, we know the truth, and then we got to uh, hold on to the truth because the world's against us. And we have to make our defense out of that kind of context. Uh, in 2 Timothy, he writes, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and says, he, uh, what you have entrusted to, what, oh, let me get it right. What, um, what he's been entrusted uh, with, he can entrust to God for the long term. Uh, that is what God has given. Timothy doesn't need to protect. God's already protected it. Uh, we can leave that to God and we can more fully dive into our experience. And so each step of our own faith journey we get, to, we get to grow in our own understanding and awareness, and the more we know, the more we realize we don't know, and the more that inspires us to take the next step and to discover more mm -hmm. about the, the greatness, the intimacy, the unfathomable nature, the majesty of God. And the more we get a glimpse of that, the more questions are opened up, and it launches us on a lifelong journey that even Paul was praying that same prayer of an adventure in his life with God that uh, he want us to pray today. Mm, man, thank you, Chris. I think this has just been some really sacred time and you just really hit on some some really powerful, beautiful things. And, and I've, I've been blessed just sitting here um, by this time together. So um, I want to leave, leave you all with a few questions um, to, to work on as a group and talk through in light of this scripture. And, um, you know, just this theme of thankfulness and, and positivity and just remembering that, that Paul's in prison. And, and he's he's writing this, um, but if you look throughout his his this letter, he's saying things like, "Man, I, I thank my God every time I remember you." Um, there's this, "I thank," "I rejoice," "I eagerly expect," "I I hope," you know. And and there's struggle. There's some struggle going on here that we're gonna get to within the church. But man, he's so positive all throughout that. And uh, one of the things we're gonna look at in the, one of the closing weeks is uh, science has even confirmed that like. 86% of a lot of the health issues we deal with stem from stress and, and negativity. And so um, as, as we look at, at these um, questions here, I, I hope these will be helpful for you. And the first is um, just make a list of five things that you are truly grateful for and share them with the group. And I think gratefulness is like a muscle. And, and I know it's something I have to cultivate and develop. So take some time and write, write down five of them uh, here and, and share them with the group. And then which verse or verses stood out to you the most and why? And so the Holy Spirit is present in your group as you read. Um, if there's a verse that just grabs you, maybe share that with the group and maybe they can help you uh, get down to why exactly it really grabbed you. And then as you close, um, try and use some of Philippians 1, 9 through 11, that prayer that Chris elaborated on. Use that as a prayer. And as you go this week, maybe it's a way that you could pray over your group your friends, your spouse, or, or your kids or grandkids. And so we just thank you so much. Uh, Chris, thank you for being here. It's always yes, good. My honor. I remember the verse. He is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. And so realizing that God already holds on to, protects, ensures, keeps all the most important things in your life. Hmm. We can live out of that confidence every day. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, man. Bless you.